What's going on, Flight Sim Crew? It's your pilot in command, Ryan, and today I'm just gonna have a short flight here in a new airport for me. This is in New Zealand, and um, we're gonna be flying the Cessna 172 with the glass cockpit, which I have come to absolutely love, but it is always good to know both vacuum gauges and the Garmin glass cockpit as well. Um, this is a new airport for me, so we're going to be flying the Cessna 172, an aircraft that I'm familiar with. And we'll be taking off here shortly. We're just doing our pre-flight checks and waiting for clearance from tower. And you'll see that today's flight is going to be um, a little um, more than what I had expected. I would like to take a moment just to say that before any flight, it is always critical to do a pre-flight to include reading the METARs, getting the weather information, um, and you don't always necessarily want to trust the METARs. I mean, they're very good, but um, don't don't let them overrule your eyes. So if you are on a runway and they say winds are calm, but obviously it's gusting and it's blowing your you know you around, blowing your flight back around, then. Uh, trust the reality and not necessarily the uh, METARs. So, um, not saying anything negative about METARs. They're wonderful. Um, perhaps in a future lesson, I can go over the ins and outs of what a METAR is. It's basically just aviation weather info. It's what we, what we go by before uh, flights. All right, so we're removing parking brake. We're making sure our fuel selector valve is turned on, making sure trim is set for takeoff and fuel selector valve is set to both. We have received clearance from tower to take off and I'm checking the windsock there. You can see we've got a little bit of cross breeze. So I'm going to be keeping my ailerons slightly into the wind um, with some anticipation that the Augusta wind could kind of pitch my airplane a little bit to the right. And of course, now as we are doing our takeoff roll, the P factor of the propeller is going to want to cause the aircraft to pitch the opposite direction. So a little bit of back and forth here. I'm not going to give myself the highest grade on this. I would always want to stay right on center line, but we have achieved rotation and we have lifted off. And New Zealand is a beautiful country, so I really just kind of wanted to see what it looked like in Microsoft Flight Simulator. But as we are doing our climb out, I am noticing immediately that the clouds are, or I should say the, the wind and the weather patterns are a bit more bumpier than what I was expecting. Again, meteors are, are your friend. And as I climb up here, you know, we're going to have terrain obstructions because this is a mountainous area. So we want to be very mindful um, of our climb outs. We want to make sure that we get above any of these potential um, uh, mountains or land masses that, uh, that could become obstacles as we're flying if we do not achieve a high enough altitude. So with that being said, I'm going to continue to maintain a climb, fighting the wind, and I, I use fighting as a, as a loose term. You, It's critical to fly the airplane. You do not want to let the airplane fly you. Uh, that is something that, that is um, very important. Great words of wisdom of my instructors is that you fly the airplane, you do not let the weather fly your airplane. <laughs> and. Um, as we get up here, I'm noticing that the thermals here are, are they're thermals. So, you know, I'm getting some um, different uh, pockets of warm and cooler air. That's probably due to the fact that I'm dealing with a river and with land, the two, uh, the two heat differently. So um, you will get different um, thermal pockets over, say, water than you would, say, over um, solid uniform terrain like if I was flying over a forest or something like that and as um, I just try to enjoy a little bit of a scenic flight here in New Zealand um, not quite as smooth as I was expecting but you know what they say smooth um, seas never make for a great sailor so and that's a benefit of a simulator is in 
situations that are a bit more dicey or, you know, maybe beyond my own personal uh, minimums or my own personal, uh, you know, flight competency where I would rate myself, which is always to err on the side of safety. Um, in the simulator, I can push myself a little bit more than what I would do if I was actually in in an aircraft and all that goes with it. So now I'm noticing that there is a, appears to be another airport, um, also a little bit of maybe a village. We always want to be mindful. You don't want to fly too low over villages. The we're in New Zealand, so FA rules aren't necessarily going to apply. Um, but the FA has has a rule set for um, that you should go no lower than I believe it's 500 feet. I could be wrong on that, but I believe you. It's no lower than 500 feet below a um, inhabited area. And you know, if you want to be on the safe side, just go to a thousand feet. Um, no one is ever going to fault you for always giving yourself a safety buffer. And now as I am flying towards this airport, I just want to get a, a look at it. I um, just want to see if it's one that, you know, I would land at. It's like I said, it's uh, very bumpy today. Maybe not the best day for a, a joyride. So... We're going to just do a little quick cruise by this airport and see what it looks like. So you'll see me looking out my passenger window a few times. And I do apologize for some of the herky-jerkiness. That is just something they haven't quite smoothed out in Microsoft Flight Simulator yet. I hope they fix that in a future update. But as you see, this is a dirt strip. So um, for, for my own personal comfort and the fact that you know in flight school you are renting someone else's airplane um, most flight schools do not want you landing on anything except for a paved runway so we will not be landing at this grass strip this is not an emergency obviously if this was an emergency if i had an, an engine failure um or if the winds were just so bad they were really exceeding my ability to control the aircraft then absolutely it would be fine for me to safely land the airplane down on that dirt strip but um that's not the case here today so what we're going to do is just using my aeronautical decision making i'm going to say okay let's head back to the home airport because it's paved it's it's got a tower and uh there's no place like home so now i'm just gonna fly over this wonderful body of water here uh, as you can see it smooths out a good bit as i'm over water and now as i get back over land you can start to see some of those thermals are really starting to um, knock around the airplane a little bit now for those of you who are not um, general aviation and enthusiast and you do not plan on going to flight school i do want to point out that the larger the aircraft the less um, thermals and wind will affect that aircraft so uh, this is a matter of inertia you know sm small aircraft small mass means that winds can toss and, and turn you well not turn but you know it can bounce you around uh, more than say if I was flying a you know a, uh, an airline with uh, a much much larger um, aircraft and much stronger engines I would not nearly feel as much of this uh, turbulence as I am currently experiencing so another thing too just for those of you who are listening and thinking oh gosh I wouldn't want to fly in these conditions um, the safety features on a commercial airline are just beyond belief. Um, basically, everything has redundancy. They have computer systems that allow them to see where turbulence is um, on the fly. And it is, I'll put it this way, aviation is the safest, safest form of transportation for a reason. Um, and uh, so no, no need to fear, you know, as you see me, uh, working against these thermals, that is not something that a commercial passenger would really have to deal with um, during their flight. They may, you may get a couple thermals uh, as you're heading up to um, to your cruising altitude, but uh, that's 
kind of few and far between and generally speaking your pilot can see that on their weather radar and they will try to avoid those thermal pockets if at all possible and if not they will turn on the seatbelt um, light and just ask you to remain in your chair um, that way you know you don't have to worry about you know your laptop flying or you know just spills happening and of course we never want a passenger to stumble and fall and potentially get injured um, that would be uh, the most um, the the least ideal circumstance I was gonna say, I was gonna say the the most worst thing that we would want to happen um, because we want our passengers to enjoy their flights and to have a nice comfortable flight so with that being said we are now going to start to make our way back to our home airport so a few moments ago you might have seen that um, I just checked to, to verify visually where that airport is as a VFR pilot myself um, of course GPS is your friend but it's always good to know where it's always good to maintain situational awareness to know where your your airports are so that there's no surprises and heaven forbid you know the GPS glitches out well no big deal I know I know the airport is to my right um, and now we just got to get back to the traffic pattern so tower has uh, provided me with the pattern um, I believe it is a right hand pattern which is uh, I don't want to say atypical um, standard traffic pattern for an uncontrolled airport meaning no tower is always going to be left hand unless specified in um, our flight um, maps but in this case I'm taking right hand traffic and you'll notice that I have mountains to my left and some hills to my right so I'm going to try to split the difference there and go down that valley because it appears that my traffic pattern is going to be on the other side of this hill to the right and I want to intercept the traffic pattern and begin my um, my procedures for getting the airplane down safely so big thing here is just to as I'm going into my descent phase obviously there's a terrain so I don't want to descend so low that terrain becomes an issue um, in where my flight school is located uh, which is along the coast this is not a factor but for me as I continue to want to improve myself as a pilot I would love to go flying up in the mountains I very much want to find an instructor who is familiar with that terrain so that I can learn from them and hopefully get the endorsement that would um, allow me to fly in more mountainous conditions. All right, now, as I enter the pattern here, you're gonna notice that Microsoft Flight Simulator has hard set rules for airspeed. So it wants me to hit a certain number, be glued to that number, and just stay there. That's fine and dandy if this was, you know, calm, calm winds and, you know, everything was, was um, I don't want to say sterile. I'll, I'll say, like, like I, ideal lab circumstances. But it's not. I'm dealing with some wind. I'm also dealing with... Um, some gust so when a gust comes all of a sudden you have extra lift when that gust stops then you lose the lift that you were using a moment ago so the airplane may sink a few feet no big deal we um, we always adjust for that but in this circumstances I'm entering the traffic pattern I'm gonna err on the side of having a little more speed than less speed because if I am flying at a very low speed while a gust is occurring and that gust decides to go away, or I may find myself at a airspeed that is uh, far too low for me to be comfortable with. Uh, not a huge deal, but we just want to avoid that. Of course, if, if I found myself in that situation, I would go full throttle in order to, um, and put my nose down a little bit since I'm in slow flight, in order to rebuild that airspeed. But if I can avoid that, I'm 
going to go ahead and just avoid that. So you'll notice here, I'm coming in. Sorry about my chair squeaking. Um, I just want to give you guys accurate info. So I am approximately 70 um, coming in during in the pattern. Um, there you can actually see the winds. I just was curious. And you can see that we are experiencing winds up to nine knots. And a little bit higher, you'll see that there is a, another layer. There it is. Okay. So um, I'll scroll down. Yes. Here we have uh, wind speeds of 11 knots, and it is gusting up to 40 knots. Now, that's that's a pretty big gust factor. Um, if, if I was flying at 7 or 8 knots and I had a gust factor up to 20, um, that's that is worth me being especially mindful of. Uh, this gust factor is literally double that. So um, vigilance, er erring on the side of caution is always the right um, decision to make. There's zero incentive for me to go as slow as Microsoft Flight Simulator wants me to go because then I I'm a little bit closer to my stall speed than I would want to be. I'd rather come in a little fast and then bleed that airspeed off once I know the runway is, you know, assured. Especially after a bumpy ride like this, is to have to, you know, overfly the airport because I'm too high or too fast. All right, so we are now in turning on final you can see the runway there you can see that my airspeed is pretty good still complaining a little bit that I'm too fast but yeah um, my airspeed is looking good and this is what we we refer to as a stabilized approach meaning that I see the runway I'm gonna line up on that center line and my you know, all of my cognitive resources right now are devoted to getting the aircraft safely down, touching main wheels first, then the nose um, gear, and bringing the airplane to a stop. So here we are, some braking. As you can see here, I'm gonna to come to pretty much a full stop. Most airports, I wouldn't do that. Um, most airports, um, I'm well, all controlled airports, I'm gonna proceed down and take the, the earliest taxiway to get off the active runway so that somebody else can use it. In some circumstances, um, Tower will tell you that right out of the gate. So they'll say, hey, you know, take a left on Bravo and taxi to general aviation parking. Um, other times the tower operator may be busy with other folks that he, he or she may not be able to um, give you that, that little pat on the back. But no big deal, I don't need that. I don't know how to, how to <laughs> quote, drive my airplane. Um, that's what taxiing is, basically. So I am going to just follow my center line here and these wonderful blue arrows that tell me which gate or which uh, tarmac they would like me to park at. And we're just going to be following this until we see a wonderful uh, co co-aviation work, worker who is going to flag me in. So. Uh, I do want to take this moment. If you have any questions, um, please drop them in the comments. That actually means a lot to the YouTube algorithm. And um, if you if you find this video you know, to be something that you might enjoy, give me a like. Um, if you know the video just doesn't float your boat a dislike's not gonna not gonna hurt my feelings but really i would love a comment so if there's something that you guys see that is um you know just not up to snuff or if you have any questions um or just anything at all um drop in a comment uh, i read every single comment and um that's just a great way to communicate with me and of course uh, I thank you all, my audience, because I want to make videos that you all enjoy. So if you leave a comment about, you know, my delivery um, or maybe the way in which I structure some of these videos, um, I am all ears and I encourage you all to. 
and I think I, I think those who have done so in the past. Okay, we've now crossed over the whole short line, so that's that double, um, you know, yellow line with the little squares on the other side. Once once I have crossed that, I am now technically off the active runway, so I can come to a full stop. I can begin my um, after landing checklist, which includes the reduction of flaps, making sure that um, the lights are the way they need to be, and. Um, I believe there's one more as my checklist. Give me a second. to general aviation parking using taxiway Alpha 4 Cessna 4 Foxtrot Mike. Um, and now I'm taxiing to general aviation parking and. After, yeah, so after landing. So after I cross that line, flaps up, transponder on standby, strobe lights off. Um, heat at heat off and then lights as required and now i have a wonderful little ai man who is directing me to my parking space and now that i'm in my parking space i will begin my securing um airplane checklist which means parking brake on avionics master off electrical equipment off autopilot should have already been turned off and uh, make sure it will then be idle cut off. Aircraft design is very slow to adopt, say, the latest and greatest of whatever the car market has. But with that being said, I'm now doing my after landing checklist, which involves me um, just basically, you know, turning, putting the parking brake back on, um, make sure it's going to go all the way out that's going to choke the engine literally starves it because there's no more fuel going into it um if i wanted to be extra safe i could flip that fuel selector valve to off instead of both and then i have there's a fuel pump button on this particular aircraft so i always tap that in order to make sure that there's no chance of fuel flowing into the engine unnecessarily all right and it's just a view of the cockpit. And I went ahead and shut off all of my, well, my one engine and my computers. So that is a wrap. Folks, thank you so much for hanging out. If you enjoyed the video, um, please give it a like. And if you enjoyed this content, uh, feel free to subscribe. I'm going to continue to just tell you guys a little bit more about what I'm learning as I'm going through my flight school and um, hopefully that will make your experience even better if you're thinking about becoming a student pilot yourself you know this might be something that gets you interested in it and if you um, have no desire to ever fly an airplane but you love flight simulators then um, this just gives you a look at uh, what is expected Thank you again for watching, and I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.